Okay, so um, I'm glad there's actually people that came here because most of the people that I tell that I'm doing a talk on the business ramifications of the internet's unclean complex are typically like, what the fuck are you talking about? <clears throat> Please so, first question. <laughs> well, and actually, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's amazing. What are you talking about? <laughs> So, um, what I am talking about needs a disclaimer. This is not a box popper talk. It is not a cool tool talk. And I'm actually going to, at my own risk, venture into that generic politics. And I expect a Because that's what makes this stuff fun. <clears throat> Does anybody recognize this date? So six months. this was what was it? <laughs> six months before D Day. So it was actually the last official declaration of war by the United States. And it was against Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. Since then, we as a nation have a, a very long and prolific history and career of quote unquote unclean context. <laughs> <clears throat> so you can see that we've, we've had a good time with these. Regardless of the outcome, we've been very kind of good at it. Um, now, this next date, does anybody recognize that? Christmas? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a drink. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, Chris, we got over here. Just, yeah. yeah just right this Christmas in 1991 was the uh, the date the Soviet Union decided. Okay. And basically, at that point, we as a nation, yeah, we won, right? <clears throat> no real nation was a good, credible threat to us, um, at least formally. Right? Informally, there's a flaw in that one. What nation in their right mind would actively confront us when it's such an easy thing through quote unquote unclean conflicts to achieve their goals? And those, you know, goals against, from a nation perspective, laws of intellectual property, our innovations, the things that actually from an economic standpoint, make us a gigantic superpower. <clears throat> so the unfortunate reality of that is that that is it start. working? What this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just. That's cool. Do you want me to? I mean, I no, no, you're good. I just want to. I, I just want to make sure it was working. Yeah, I'm good. I mean, everybody can hear me. Right? Yeah. Cool. All right. Sorry. Right. Thanks, Mark. Sorry. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Hugs. Um, the unfortunate reality of that, like, you know, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union is that this total mindset um, of who's really going to confront us from an adversary perspective filtered down into our business. And our businesses, right, all, all, you know, regardless of vertical, right, our businesses and innovators started thinking the same way. Who's realistically going to step up to the plate and actively confront us? I mean, to a degree, once that mindset filtered down to our businesses, I mean, look at some of the results, right? You know, you had the banking um, uh, restrictions eliminated. Now you have both sides of the banks, you know, from a financial perspective, and now all that stuff led to what, regardless of your politics, right? You know, that stuff happened. And <clears throat> to a degree, we really kind of, our, our, our innovators, our business leaders, started realistically thinking that everybody else on the planet, from a business perspective, would behave the same way that we wanted them to. And that realistically didn't happen, right? <clears throat> now, I'm not gonna go into details. I mean, obviously, you have China, you have 
the, I mean, you know, our allies, right? France, Israel, whatever. All this stuff is really kind of, um, it's been happening, and I would say probably over the last three years, it's really kind of gotten into the media. And once it gets into the media, now it becomes a problem. And eventually, what, you know, when you're that backwards, right? And, and, and this, this statement is you know, very, very pertinent, right? Why spend billions of dollars developing innovative stuff when you can purchase them for a million, right? That's a market. That's a supply and demand gigantic market. And, <clears throat> and we're now shocked that the rest of the world isn't really playing by the way we want them to play. They're not playing by our rules. Um, so one of the unfortunate kind of you know, uh, blowbacks here from, from our perspective in this country is that now we're, in a, we're basically you know, trying to mitigate our lack of foresight through legislation. We have all of these different cyber, 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 whatever, cyber law, you know, attempts at legislation being passed. And you know, in reality, when you get to that point, where you're trying to solve these types of, of big problems through legislation, you've completely missed the point in the first place, right? <clears throat> so this term, I've, I've been finding, I've been getting a lot of use out of this term, this organization entropy, right? When you think you're smarter than your adversaries, you basically, are lulled into this state of, well, who's gonna fuck with me, right? And and it's, you know, that, that's wrong, it doesn't happen like that. <clears throat> Everybody in here in InfoSec or Risk or, or what have you, right? There's a set of roles that we play, and realistically when you associate those roles to the business, it kind of boils down to this, right? You gotta protect the loss of both replaceable and irreplaceable data, right? And when I say that, I, I'm not gonna go off on a tangent, but from a, from a policy and audit perspective, most of our, our, our audit frameworks are geared around, and Josh Corman talks a lot about this, but they're geared around replaceable data, right? Credit cards, social security numbers, right? We all have this mindset that they're very important, but guess what? You can replace them. You can't replace innovations, intellectual property, once they're gone, what are you going to do? You, you stand, essentially, you're going, to, you're going to be looking in the face of these types of ramifications, right? Specifically with intellectual property, lower quality, you know, lower quality goods, lost sales, brand value is gone, uh, and, and from a national perspective, falling economic growth, that's an issue. Uh, an organization that, that, that we work with had to completely readjust their earnings because of a some type of breach that, that led to their technology now showing up in international markets at a gigantically low cost. That's an issue. You multiply that out, and now we have an economic freefall to a degree, or at least the risk of it. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd completely say we're there yet, but you know we're we're getting there, and it's a problem, and we're reacting to it. Stuff that's already happened, and everybody knows a reactive posture is never gonna is never gonna eliminate, mitigate, or remediate anything realistically. <clears throat> so. All of these problems that we as security professionals deal with on a daily basis are, are, are kind of a small subset of, of larger informational problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and and these, these problems um, go into society, go into politics. All of these different variables are, are absolutely involved. Right? And unfortunately right now we are currently in an era or part, you know, in, in terms of time, and an era where policy is dictating society 
which is an unnatural system. Society, theoretically, should dictate policy. And because, because of, it's an unnatural system, the majority of these policies that are being brought forth, etc., are really smoke screens that are masking real root issues in terms of what we're you know, what is happening to our innovations, our brands, and therefore all that stuff that affects our economy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, and, and going out on a limb, a lot of these root causes realistically are, are from a root cause analysis, right? Power, greed, what have you. you know, it, it, at this point, I don't want, I, and I'm not, I obviously don't have time to go into that, but root cause analysis, you've got this stuff going on and, and it's a problem. And, and the reaction, the reactional um, effects of how we're dealing with all this stuff directly correlate to how things are actually you know, deriving on a, on a business and, and, and an economic scale. So the longer we accept these unnatural policies and these unnatural systems, the sooner that our adversaries are going to eventually catch up with us because we're not paying attention to everybody else. This assumption that, hey, we're still big bad superpower from a, both a, a, you know, a military government, you know, as well as a business perspective. And <clears throat> losing sight of that, I mean, you know, not having that fresh in your mind, we are basically in a, a, a position in time right now where the Chinas, the what have yous, are, you know, through these unclean conflicts, gathering up a lot of this innovation that we rely on from a growth perspective and utilizing it to kind of undercut everything that we've been doing. Joel Brenner uh, wrote this book, America the Vulnerable. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying <clears throat> that book tends to be utilized by a lot of security equipment vendors as FUD, okay? There's a lot of stuff in there that's like, oh my God, the sky is falling. And a lot of it, a lot of it's true. However, this quote is really, really, it really kind of puts it to the point, right? We need to learn to live in a world where less and less information can be kept secret and where secret information will remain secret for less and less time. From an architecture perspective, you have to design your systems to assume the breach at this point. Assuming the breach and then understanding how from a, from a, a defense perspective, how can, we, uh, how can we basically make our systems designed in such a way where, okay, this breach happens, but this stuff is still okay. Data classification policies in organizations are critical. You hear a lot about data loss prevention. Despite my opinions about some of the technologies, you know, the, there's no question that those policies are critical in understanding, A, where your information lives, because most organizations don't, right? Where's your perimeter? Oops, you know, do you realistically know who has access to some of this critical information from a business perspective, your innovations, your formulas, and now, based on who that person actually is, are they allowed to connect with this thing, or, you know, what have you? And so, being able to, from a, from a realistically a holistic perspective, designing your systems so in such a way that they, they, that stuff, that important stuff can survive the breach is super critical at this point. <clears throat> so one of the things that we as, I would say, organizational systems are really, really bad at is adaptability. Um, we keep getting pummeled by all these statistics Right, the Verizon DBIR, right? 
92% of the breaches this past year went unnoticed. And okay, that's clearly an issue. And are we actually responding to those types of statistics adequately? Is better detection the answer? If A, we don't have good data classification, and B, we're just not paying attention. If 92% of the breaches went undetected, then how many organizations went out of business? Anyone? I'd venture to say very few. Not, not that it's not a problem, but maybe that's not the issue. There's lots and lots of critical, uh, you know, criticism on your firewalls, especially your antivirus. Um, but all of these nifty tools and systems, that's not adapting to anything. That's just, oh, bright and shiny lights. It's somebody says that that will protect me and make me blah, blah, blah compliant. Soul, racket. And that's has nothing to do with adaptation. <clears throat> adaptation arises from when you are, well, from leaving or being forced from your comfort zone. And right now, we kind of have this opportunity because since that Cold War era arrogance that, that filtered down into our business DNA, and we thought everybody was gonna be doing business the way we said or, you know, Here's our rules, play by them, and that's clearly not the case. We have an opportunity at this point to kind of get our asses kicked into an adaptation kind of direction. Um, we'll see how that works. You know? And this is kind of the last couple of slides here about adaptation and adaptability. Um, you know, has anybody read this book? Learning from the Octopus. Uh, how secrets from nature can help us fight terrorist attacks, natural disasters, and disease. Every information security professional should read this book. It talks all about how natural systems, A, natural systems, and how they, they, they essentially survive, adapt, and whatnot. You know, one of the, one of the interesting tidbits that, that I, I got out of this is it was written by a, a, a biologist, and he said, Darwinism is completely misunderstood because it's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the good enough. And if you're good enough to do certain things and be able to survive and adapt to your surroundings, then that's a successful natural system. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to adapt. <clears throat> and that's, I think really, in, in my opinion, that's the biggest that's the biggest thing I would hope you know, people take from this little stable talk is that our, our organizational systems really need to kind of migrate from this unnatural policy is king and, and you know, top down structure to a more natural system that has the ability to adapt. <clears throat> the benefits of decentralized and distributed organizational systems. When, you, when, when I say this, think of your immune system. It's a completely, um, you know, it's a distributed network that has the ability to react to something and concentrate energy or something into whatever unusual activity it has discovered. Um, these benefits include multiple sensors, right? So. With a system that has multiple sensors, you have a greater, much greater chance of actually identifying unusual changes within your organization or your natural system. No preconceived notions, <clears throat> um, which essentially seeing the environment for what it is as opposed to what has been defined. Right? And then finally, you know, specialized tasks include, you know, the by utilizing and having things that have specialized tasks, you have the ability to allow resources to get assigned to important tasks and thereby saving energy, right? 
successful adaptation really requires a challenge. And when you talk about having an organizational system or a natural system that has challenges, a challenge isn't, we're gonna configure the firewall this week. A challenge isn't, we're gonna put in this or we're gonna do this and here are your orders. A challenge is, has anybody read the, the book uh, Wisdom of Crowds? Anyone? So, parts of it. Okay. Yeah. So, Wisdom of Crowds theory is that when you, and it's a, I don't know how much do I have time to do a sidetrack? Sure, why not? Uh, Wisdom of Crowds is you, know, you take a problem and you give it to a whole bunch of different people at different levels of like intellect or power or whatever, but it has to be a nice big mass distribution of people. And the sum of all of their answers is the closest actually to the problem. Individual answers could be way off. And, and one of the examples which I totally blew my mind is, uh, I think it was 1967 and uh, our, it was the only nuclear sub that we lost. It was the USS Scorpion. And the guy, the, the director of the Navy sent a challenge out to the entire Navy themselves. Everybody, the janitors, generals, what have you. And they, basically the challenge was, in your own words or whatever, tell me how you think it went down and where it went down. And you know, they went out and when they pulled all the answers, the collective answer, and this was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? The collective answer by pulling all of this gigantic distribution of people was 225 yards away from the actual location of this sub. It was unreal. So adaptability requires these challenges that, you know, for all intents and purposes, utilizes this kind of wisdom of crowds mentality. And it, and again, it's not it's not saying this is how we're going to do things, it's how are we going to do things. That's, that spurs adaptation. <clears throat> and it's something that, again, we as a business culture are just not very good at. So, last slide here um, is, uh, I'll just pull through this real quick, right? <clears throat> Businesses and therefore security strategies must switch from designing solutions to adapting solutions. Moving away from orders and providing well, challenges for your people, that spurs adaptation, that spurs creativity. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, from a challenge perspective, there are many solutions. It's not us as, like, say, a director level saying, we need to get to this point. It's, hey, we have a goal, let's figure out how we collectively can meet these goals. Not assuming that there's only one way to do that. The last thing um, from a, you know, a, again, a generic politics perspective is look, you know, we have these issues. We have people who are not focusing on actual business slash economic problems. They're defining policy, or policy is defining society as opposed to society defining policy, which is completely unnatural in its, it's an unnatural system. It's all smokescreen. The stuff that a lot of people think are important, in my opinion, isn't. So vote them out. That's it. Feedback. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Anybody want to argue? I like arguing. We do have some booze over there, too. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any questions? Any comments? Why didn't you bring this up in the class that we were in? You were, uh, felt like uh, you had this wisdom to be, give all of them. Because, because I was completely um, in fear of Nickerson. I don't like <laughs> <laughs> that dude is unreal. I, I, seriously, I think he might be one of the most dangerous persons on the planet. <laughs>
And, but, and you know, I, I, we started out that class. We did the red teaming class with, uh, with Chris Nickerson. We started out, uh, uh, so who's next, by the way? Am I stepping on their toes? Are they real? All right. We started that class, and it was great because, you know, there was a lot of upfront business risk kind of talk. Which, that's kind of like my area. Penetration testing, I do red teaming, you know, not really do, but that was really fun to go through that class. But, um, yeah, I mean, that was my, I was like, oh, cool, yeah, we're actually talking about shit that I know. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a different scenario as far as I'm concerned. You know. <clears throat> Any other comments? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.